As always, you can call someone, text someone, even take a message and put it around a pigeon and tell someone that you appreciate them. Welcome to the M1 File. My name is Dr. Ivory L. Taylor. I'm very happy to be here today, and I hope that you had a beautiful weekend. Everything is going well, well for you. Our last piece, um, we was talking about poverty and how do we move out of poverty, um, as well as do the masses or do people who does these surveys, do they kind of put their input in there um, and saying, we want to get out of poverty, but then again, do we really want to get out of poverty? Um, and the scores that came up, and these are round number scores, because there's um, two different reports that came out. And as, as I go back, dealing with Memphis, I want to say every third year or every other year, give or take, there's always a report that comes out about poverty um, and, and where we are. And this particular report that came out a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, we're somewhere in that 29, 30%, especially when it comes to children. I don't have the report in front of me. I only have the figures because I think that whenever we do surveys or whenever we do research, we have to go inside there and see who participated, what area was a part of it, as, as well as the credibility of the researcher. Because um, I can do some small numbers and I can get some big scores. I can do some big, some big uh, participants and I can get some low scores. It's all, it's all a part of what was in, in, the, in the research in order to bring these numbers about. But also um, this week, we found out in the Memphis area, there's about 2,000 jobs that need to be filled. And a lot of the um, people from industry are saying that they can't fill them. Um, either the people are not qualified to fill these positions or they have no desire to work. But um, as I, I did my own the, the research, a lot of what we call warehousing jobs, there are signs all over the place saying we need help. We need help. We need help. And as we look at a lot of our technology jobs, um, our workforce is saying that they are not qualified to go in these areas. But also, when, when we look at workforce development and we look at poverty, and now we find out that there's a huge argument between engineering science and behavior science. Okay. A lot of time, the people who are on the side of workforce development and the engineering science, they get their triggers or they get their, their glimpse of the vision of workforce from behavior science. Because behavior science deal with the people themselves and people behavior and, and how they act, how they interact. And he gives signals over to the other side of the house and said, we may need to do more here in order to move the job market forward. Like, for example, when, when we now, when we look in, let's just say the automobile, the automobile industry. A couple years ago, now more, let's say 10 years ago, they began to test on cars or buses or in a transportation field um, being operated with the computer itself. Take, take the human person out of it and they're going to just run these, um, these, this industry by, by computers. And one of the arguments was that dealing with people of the behavior side uh, you, you, let me use the word table. Uh, people don't want to come to work. When they come to work, they don't want to be there. Uh, sometimes they're not knowledgeable. Uh, sometimes they don't want to learn. Um, and on and on and on and on. Because they need health care, media training, and they have families. All these things are over there. But on the engineering side, side of the house, we can make a robot they can do 24 seven. And as we continue to keep working on it, we have low maintenance. Uh, we can use a tech there. And this robot 
can just go on and on and on and on like the little rabbit does. But then again, over here, if there's not jobs enough for people on this side, behavior science side of the house, now you're going to have crime because they're connected. Um, I read an article this morning. Um, some people was had pom-poms up and some people had their hair down. But Memphis... The city of Memphis is now ranked number two in the most dangerous city in the country. Number two. Number two is the most dangerous city in the country. So now, does industry come here? Does industry stay away? Do people move to the Memphis area or do people stay away? How do we tackle crime? How do we bring those numbers down? Or, or do we just say it's a norm? It's just where it is, where it is, where it is. So now we have behavior scientists saying that's where it is. We have industry over here are saying we got to figure out a way how we can make robots or robotics. Uh, we can make more what we call tangible tools to combat moving forward. And it's a huge argument. A huge argument. What do we do? If you look at behavior science, you look at uh, a lot of these online um, dating uh, platforms where if you can't uh, interact and find you a date, you, you sign in to these platforms and they'll find you a date. I was reading an article where, um, and I did sign in on it, it, it says that a lot of females uh, waiting to the 35, I think it what it was, to even have an uh, inkling, or even just to think about getting married because they can't find a gentleman on the other side that's making enough money or mature enough that they can be compatible, or that, that, that they can mate with. And I said, wow. Um, because <laughs> it's mating with or a dating, a marriage, or have you, you want to build that relationship, is it all about money? Or is it about love? But then again, is love and money, or love and wealth, or love and tangible, they interlock with each other? I mean, it's on a question. So over here, the guy's saying, I compete for the job the same way you're competing for the job. And the woman on this side is saying, you need to do a better job because I can be in debt by myself or I can live by myself. I don't need to carry that piece on with me. So how do we figure that piece out right there? I don't have an answer. I'm off the market, so I don't have, I don't have an answer there. And I was arguing last week that um that when it comes to learning, learning is very connected to culture. Um, and we're finding that in the, in the area of people of color now, okay, they learn better with hands-on. It's just that culture, that culture learns better that way. So when it comes to education, do we try to set a table of learning that fit the culture, or do we try to get the culture to fit the theory of education? How do we do that? I mean, uh, should we do it? Should we not do it? Or do we fit education for the needs of the workforce development? If we look out there 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, and we're saying that the job market that will be coming will be more robotics, more technology driven and less human as a part of the touch then how do we platform education then especially from K to 12 how do we do that and these are some of the questions that are at the marketplace but being at the marketplace we have all these ideas we have all these meetings we have all these theories and opinions and I believe that if we put more into execution and 
unless with all these opinions, we would do better. I either have a little of this, a little of that. Some some um, countries, I remember when I lived in Germany, I want to say it's the eighth grade, but don't hold it because it may be the seventh grade. The kids would go to seventh, eighth grade, and, and them and their parents would make a choice. Do the kids go on the academia side of the track, or do they go what we call the hands-on side of our education track? Now, when it comes to money, it's about the same because uh, when I was over there uh, almost 20 years ago, the guys that worked on, uh, the ladies that worked on the BMW or the Mercedes, they had on these nice little white jackets and, and different color jackets, and they didn't get all that oil and gritty and all that kind of stuff there because it was all technology driven. So whether they went this way or that way, when it comes to money, it was tit to tat about the same. Because Germany realized that they needed both. They needed both. And there was a time in our, in our culture that um, vocation was always needed. And then we came to this piece about college bound only, and then vocation became a nasty word. Um, um, people began to look down on that. But I, I do know that when we look at spinachers, how we spend our money, we spend our money on things that vocation create a vocation mate a vocation maintain. Like for example, our living. In other words, where we live in an apartment, a condo, a townhouse, or just a residential home, or wherever it is, right? Housing is very much needed and we spend an investment there. Okay. When it comes to transportation, whether it's a bus, car, boat, airplane, train, or just a plane, automobile, we spend money in transportation. Whether it's going back and forth from work, back and forth from church, or just leisure. You say, well, I'm going to take a trip around the world. I'm, I'm just going to take a trip and just, just go visit another country, or I'm just going to just go for a ride. Transportation comes from what we call career education type um, employment. When it comes to uh, outer culture, uh, we look at um, how food is grown, uh, whether um, we use a tractor, you know, to, to ply the fields, or we use a low-cost air, um, um, airline to come and spray the fields, or people get out there and, and they work in the fields. So now we know how we live, which is um, residential or commercial living. We invest that money. That's career education. Um, transportation, career education, outer culture, career education. And there's another one, our clothing. Our clothing. Clothing is a huge industry. Huge industry. Whether you're a model or whether you're at the, at the bottom end putting clothes in a box and shipping it off. It's a huge industry, and that's career technology. So do we really want to get rid of vocation or get rid of technology? I mean, uh, career technology, a career uh, vocation. I would say no. Because I know that now, if you call for a plumber, trust me, it's going to be hard to get him that same day. I'm him, him or her, <coughs> excuse me, that same day. Very difficult. Uh, if a tree falls on your home from a storm, you have to wait in line to get that particular person to come cut the tree up, move the tree, and so forth and so on. Now, sure, technology is now beginning to play a part because uh, when the, um, the trash truck or the trash uh, pickup crew, they come by now, and they only have one man now. Uh, one woman, I only see one man. And the truck scoops over, uh, pick up the container, dumps it, and put it back down. Where before, you may have three or four guys on the back of the truck, and they will actually get off the truck and dump it and move on. And that's what you have, I said earlier, you have behavior science, which deal with the human humanity or people them, themselves, and you have engineering science, 
It's where we're going to make things to substitute people where we would say, I don't need you anymore. Because it costs me more to have you to come to the workplace than to have a robot or robotics to replace you. So if you are a leader in the community, if you're a parent, if you have some concern about going forward or your grandchildren or children, or how, whatever your place is, you may need to stand up and say something as, as we go forth. Because on the rebuttal side, they are doing everything they can to replace people because they're saying that people don't want to work. And when we look at workforce development, you can argue that point that it takes more for a person to come to work and maintain that per person versus having a computer or a robot or something on this side to replace them. Um, even in the healthcare field, there was a time that um, you may have uh, uh, three or four nurses to come in your room. Now, it's down, it's down to like two now. They come in, they put all these little things on you and everything, and they get to print out at, the, at that time. They don't have to ship it off anymore. Also, uh, now, um, if you have an accident um, or ailment or something that's going on, you can get an MRI, and it will actually tell you the spot that the information is occurring. Where before, we had to wait, wait weeks or month to get the information. Now we can get it on the spot. So we need less people now versus time before. So the question is, what do you do with these people? Do they just, you know, scatter or do they just sit there or what? What do you, what do, you do with them? And these are, these are questions that is out there. Even uh, the people who are in the, uh, I would say, the, um, the theology or the religious arena. Uh, there are some people now who have churches without walls. They do a video the same way we're doing it now. They'll do a live streaming, a broadcast, a podcast, and they just come into your room and ask you to donate. And you stay home in your pajamas. You don't have to come in, get in the car, and try to be on time to come into church to praise God as, 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 as before. I never could understand until I did a small, a, a little small research is why after 12 around at one or two o'clock you have all these these brimstones type preachers come on and I said why they come on then but there's a lot of people who up those those time of morning listen to those things and I was listening to it, I think I hope I said it right under common.com and they was asking for people I want to say it was $50, $55 a month for a year. And they were saying that if you need a prayer request and you get your cell phone and you donate $55 for a year, which is 12 months, God going to come and bless you. You're going to get a hundred flow or seven times of what um, the um, the fifty dollars a month times twelve, and I was sitting there. I said, "Man, wow!" And then when that show goes off, another show comes on, Hell and Brimstones. So now these people now they don't have to ha build these big cathedrals, uh, these big high buildings and stuff to what I would say preach the gospel or present the gospel. They can be in a studio. And they can show different clips of people praying for you. And if you're depressed, if you're in poverty, or if you're uneducated, or even if you are, you are educated, but you're just, you're just stressed out. 
He said, you know what? I'm going to pay this $55 a month for a year to get ahead. And people pay it. They pay it. Now, and that's dealing with what we call behavior science. Now, I'm more prone to the other side. I really take my $55 a month and invest in the stock market. Seriously. And I shared it with some friends of mine, and they said, Taylor, it takes too long. But yet and still, they would sit there and watch a ball game for at least an hour to two hours. And that's entertainment. But what happens, the entertainment get their research from behavior science. They're saying, what does people really enjoy doing? And they say, well, people enjoy the feeling of winning and losing. And they enjoy the brutal part of ball games. So what happened is they, ESPN have made millions of dollars on behavior science research. So now they would just show on and on of football games and baseball games and basketball games. They let it stay out there. And then Sunday, you know, we come and we would sit there four or five hours watching sports. Or we go to a sports party or we have a, a Super Bowl party and all these types type of things there. But we won't sit here and say, well, you know what? I'm going to take my money and I'm going to learn about the stock market. Or I'm going to say, I'm going to take 30 minutes a day and I'm going to read. But I take hours uh, to watch sports. And I find myself doing the same thing sometimes. Like, for example, Sunday, yesterday, I was watching Tiger. Uh, and I was hoping that Tiger would, would get his next victory. And the wife and I started laughing because I had a book that I was reading. I had Tiger on the uh, television. And I had my, uh, my phone reading another article. And we looked at each other and we started laughing because I'm a big component of multiple intelligence. I believe that the mind can do a lot of things if you train it to do that. So I was reading this article about, about um, the different learning styles according to culture. Watching Tiger, hoping Tiger uh, win the, what was it, Zio Zio uh, tournament there. And Ty, uh, Mr. Sneed, uh, I think it was 80, 82 um, championship uh, run. And and my phone, I was looking at the dividends of stocks and how they're going to do this quarter. And the mind can do that if you train the mind to do that. And we just stopped, stopped laughing. This, this is my point. If we're going to go forth and be or become more of an achiever, we're going to have to do things different because the way that we're doing them now, it's not working. It's just not working. And we're going to have to sit down, and I like to tell people what they have to do is, is to look at engineering science or technology science or robotic science over here versus behavior science over here and see how can we balance the two. You know, what's good, what's bad, and how can we balance those two there? Because both of them are, be, are, are before us. And if one outdo the other one, it will become unbalanced. And then we have to ask the question is, where do we suffer or where do we gain? So my point is, entertain the argument between behavior science and robotic science or engineering science. How do we do that? And then that way we can have a better education system. A better education system. Because we who are older, 
we moving to more, we, we are exiting the stage. And we who are younger are coming more onto the stage. And we're hoping that we who are older can leave a better world behind as though our foreparents left for us. My name is Dr. Avery Otella, and I want to say thank you for your time today. But entertain it in your mind. Behavior science versus engineering. Hi, I'm Deidre Malone, the host of Dialogue with Deidre. You can find us on the M1 TV network on YouTube. Subscribe and follow us. You can also find us on Facebook at M1 TV Network, Twitter, M1 TV Network 2, and Instagram, M1 TV Network 2. Please follow us so you can keep up to date with what's going on on the M1 TV Network with Dialogue with Deidre and Black Thought.